What did David do to Amasa, Absalom's commander? This is the question that we seek to answer today as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of 2 Samuel on walking through the Bible. Today we're going to be discussing 2 Samuel chapter 19, verses 9 to 17. But before we do that, let's read the passage. If you have a Bible with you, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 9. But if you don't have a Bible, don't worry, just follow along with us on the screen. The version that we'll be reading from is the New King James Version. So 2 Samuel chapter 19, beginning of verse 9. Now all the people were in a dispute throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, The king saved us from the hand of our enemies. He delivered us from the hand of the Philistines, and now he has fled from the land because of Absalom. But Absalom, whom we have anointed over us, has died in battle. Now therefore, why do you say nothing about bringing back the king? So David sent to Zadok and Abiathar the priest, saying, Speak to the elders of Judah, saying, why are you the last to bring the king back to his house, since the words of all Israel have come to the king to his very house? You are my brethren. You are my bone and my flesh. Why then are you the last to bring, the, uh, bring back the king? And say to Amasa, Are you not my bone and my flesh? God do so to me and more also, if you are not commander of the army before me continually in place of Joab. So he swayed the hearts of all the men of Judah, just as the heart of one man, so that they sent this word to the king, Return, you and all your servants. Then the king returned and came to the Jordan. And Judah came to Gilgal to meet the king, to escort the king across the Jordan. And Shimei, the son of Gera, Benjamin, who was from Bahurim, hurried and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. There were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, and Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, and his fifteen sons and his twenty servants with him. And they went over the Jordan before the king. The battle is over and Absalom has been defeated. David has been chastened by Joab for mourning too much for Absalom to the detriment of those who had risked their lives for him that day. And David has calmed his people down and likely thanked them for their bravery. But even though Absalom is dead, David isn't automatically installed as king again. Yes, he was still the anointed of God. But for any king to have legitimacy, his people must be willing to submit to his rule. Israel had conspired against David and had anointed Absalom as king over them. Notice how verse 10 readily admits that it was Israel who had anointed Absalom, not God. Up until this point, God had anointed the king because ultimately God was Israel's king. God through Samuel had anointed Saul and God through Samuel had anointed David. Israel had not consulted God nor received his approval to anoint Absalom and thus suffered the consequences for that decision. With Absalom dead, the tribes of Israel came to their senses and noted what David had done for them in the past in defeating their enemies, including the Philistines. Therefore, with Absalom being dead, it was only right for David to be king again. When 2 Samuel uses the term Israel here, there is a contrast between the northern tribes and the tribe of Judah. We will see this split more pronounced after the days of David's son, Solomon, but in reality it has always existed to some degree since Israel entered Canaan. Joshua was the leader who led Israel into Canaan, and he was from the tribe of Ephraim. The tabernacle was in Shiloh for much of the first 300 years of Israel's existence, a city in the tribe of Ephraim. Thus the religious center and much of the political power at that time laid in the north. But Judah had been promised kingship by Jacob back in Genesis 49 verse 10, and in the days of David that prophecy began coming true. Back in the days of Saul, I'm sure the northern tribes were initially spurned when the first king came from Benjamin and not them, but they submitted to Saul after what he did to save the men of Jabesh Gilead in 1 Samuel 11. And then after the death of Saul, it was the northern tribes that didn't initially submit to David, with them only submitting after the deaths of Abner and Ishbosheth. Even coming down to Absalom, it appears that when 2 Samuel 15 verse 6 said that Absalom stole the people's hearts away, it was the northern tribes that led the way in that too. Therefore, it should be no surprise that after the days of Solomon, when Rehoboam 
wouldn't heed the voice of the northern tribes to ease the burdens Solomon had placed on them, but they rebelled. That rebellion didn't happen overnight. That schism didn't appear after Solomon. It had always been laying under the surface, with the nation only being brought together for a short time, especially under the reigns of David and Solomon. Here in 2 Samuel 19, it is the northern tribes that come to their senses first, and when word comes to David, he calls for Zadok the priest to ask him why Judah hasn't come to make him king again, for after all, David is from their tribe. He gives instructions to Zadok not only to ask Judah this, but to approach Amasa, Absalom's commander, who obviously survived the battle, and who was another nephew of David through his sister Abigail, to be commander of David's army in place of Joab. Why would David do this? Well, it appears that David has had enough of Joab and his attitude towards him. Joab may have been right concerning Absalom, but David didn't have to like the advice nor the way that it was given. Joab may have been a skilled general and led Israel to many victories, but he had killed Abner in cold blood and endangered the reunification of Israel just over 20 years earlier, and now he had disobeyed the king in killing Absalom. Clearly, no matter what Joab knew and what he might reveal to Israel, David thought he would be better off with Amasa leading his army. Now why David picked Amasa seemed to be simply because Amasa's relation to David not qualifications, for Amasa had lost the only battle he led, and that was against David's men, with an army who should have obliterated David's men through sheer size alone. But David wasn't going to pick Abishai, Joab's brother, for the same reason he didn't want to keep Joab. So if David was going to keep the command of his army and the family, Amasa was the choice. But such a choice is not going to go well for Amasa, as we'll see in future lessons. Once Zadok had talked with the elders of Judah, they sent word to the king to return. And so David left Mahanaim and Gilead and returned to the Jordan, where he had crossed earlier, which was near Gilgal. Coming to meet him was Shimei, who had cursed David on his way out of Jerusalem, and Ziba, a man who, t uh, who told David of Mephibosheth's supposed treachery. Along with these men came a thousand men of Benjamin to greet, da to greet David and to welcome him back as king. The passage mentions that Shimei came is important, for we will see what David will do to him, the Lord willing, in the next lesson. With that, our time is up for today. The Lord willing, we hope you'll join us for tomorrow's discussion of 2 Samuel chapter 19, verses 18 to 30, as we continue our walk through the Bible, one verse at a time. I'm not a Thank you for watching today's episode. We hope that you found it edifying and ask that you not only subscribe to our channel and podcast, but that you like and share this episode among your friends so that the saving gospel of Jesus Christ can go out to the whole world. Of his